The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Happy Monday, everybody! Ten day countdown until NBA stuff that matters. Less than that until preseason games, although I'm still debating whether or not I want to have that on in the background or actual baseball games. I just, uh, I don't know. I think, I worry perhaps that I've overhyped the idea of any sort of new sports content in my mind, and there's just no way that baseball games or basketball games are going to live up to the expectations I've set in my brain. So what I'm going to do between now and Thursday, because, damn, baseball starts in three days, is I'm going to convince myself it's not interesting at all. The process has begun. It's, uh, I'm George Costanza it. It's not a lie if you believe it. I'm going to start convincing myself that it's not going to be that interesting, and it's going to be very humdrum, and then that way when it happens, I can be like, oh, this is nice, instead of me expecting that somehow you know, a sporting event is going to change the way my days go and then feeling mildly disappointed when it's just something nice to have on in the background. I am quite excited about the fact that NBA games are going to be happening in the daytime, but that, whatever, we've we've talked about that before on this show. Welcome to the pod, everybody. It's Monday. It's Fantasy NBA Today. I'm Dan Vespers. This is a hoop ball presentation as per usual. As per usual, you guys know the drill. That is at HoopBallFantasy on Twitter. If you'd like to give me a follow, I am at Dan Bespris. I honestly, I, I really don't know if there are uh, new people finding shows right now. This is a weird time because we've never experienced anything like it before. I'll let you guys behind the curtain here for a moment before we dive deep into the fantasy stuff today. And remember, we're working our way through an industry mock draft. I believe we were 50 picks in as of Friday and uh, a lot a lot happened over the weekend. Um, some three and a half, four rounds actually completed. So we'll, we'll sort of plot our way through some of those here a little bit a lot later in the program. But just to go pull back the curtain a tiny bit, as a fantasy basketball podcast, and I think this is probably different than a traditional basketball podcast or, you know, we have DFS. DFS Today came back over the weekend, which was also really exciting. Um... Today in Sports Betting is rumbling along. Those shows have sort of a different trajectory where in a full-season fantasy show, which is what this is, over the course of a year, people stop listening because they either fall out of contention, which hopefully isn't happening if they're actually taking the advice from the, the shows they're listening to, or just attrition. And then certainly by March and April, head-to-head leagues, you start to see numbers dwindle because leagues end. They just end. And when the regular season is over, people stop listening to fantasy podcasts. Not all of you. Many of you continue to listen even through this crazy COVID shutdown, which I'm forever grateful for because without that, it would be uh, pretty painful to (laughs) put a show together if nobody was paying attention to it. Um, But basically you lose some large chunk when the regular season ends because people tune in for fantasy information and there's not going to be another fantasy relevant thing really until free agency. Nothing happens during the playoffs. Nothing fantasy relevant happens during the playoffs. That came early this year because on March 11th, the NBA shut down. Most fantasy leagues were basically done at that point. And then once we got the word of when things were returning and how it became almost entirely locked in that fantasy seasons had ended on March 11th. So everything just sort of pulled the plug. What I don't know is, one, how many people are actually going to be doing these resumption leagues. I think the number is, I'm guessing, relatively low, at least compared to the the broader public, because Fantrax is pretty much the only place that has these leagues going, and unfortunately a lot of folks just don't know about them uh, to play. And you guys do, because we've talked about it, but you know, Yahoo doesn't have resumption or playoff leagues ESPN doesn't have resumption or playoff leagues CBS so the big guys are not in the mix which means there aren't that many people playing these things 
So I don't know. Maybe a bunch of you guys will find this show for a first time if you're just trying out the resumption leagues. But I get the feeling that most first-time fantasy players are probably not checking in for an eight-game points league sprint at the end of July, beginning of August in crazy COVID shutdown year. So we shall see. And honestly, I lost track of what I was talking about at the beginning of all of that. There was something I was going to say to if somebody was a first-time listener and um, I've forgotten what it was. So in the words of the great Bob Uecker from Major League, the hell with it. We'll just keep rumbling along here. Those of you that have been tuning in lately know we've been preparing ourselves for the resumption leagues. But before we even get into that pretty big announcement here at Hoopball, we've brought on the great Adam King, who's guested on this pod before. I think he was on uh, during uh, draft season last year. The marvelous Adam King, he'll be coming on the podcast at some point in the next week or two, I would think, to uh, just discuss things at Hoopball and the, the changeover. He's at Adam King 91 on Twitter. We are extraordinarily excited to have him on board. He is, you know, I, I think some of you guys have called me the hardest working man in fantasy. I think he might beat me on that front. He might beat me. It's just, he's a grinder and he's the perfect, perfect hoop ball guy. So we're just so thrilled to have him on. Welcome to the mix, Adam. And uh, you guys are going to love what you get out of Adam uh, as he rumbles along here at hoop ball. We were talking on Friday about the a resumption league mock draft that was actually it's actually being run by Adam, who we just talked about. We had gotten through the top 50 picks, and so far it really had been illuminating. You just we've we've done all of this work uh, to to prepare ourselves based on basically how many games we think players are going to be playing. That's almost that's almost the entire job in this resumption is figuring out how many games you're going to get out of the guys you're drafting and making sure that your uppermost guys are going to give you seven or more. Seven, sort of the lower limit. And it's really been interesting to me so far how many risks people are willing to take because if you get, if you get a goose egg early, if you get somebody who only plays two or three games or just you know, doesn't live up to the number, it, it, to me it's harder to come back from. There's just fewer players to pick from in this spot. And if there are pickups, they're probably not going to be until game six, five, six, whatever. Handful of guys that step up when veterans get shut down, teams getting eliminated, stuff like that, or, or teams locking up their spots. There just there aren't as many ways in this resumption to atone for a bad early pick as you have during a regular season. There's so much time during a regular season to attack different categories and basically just to cover your butt or go into a punt format, whatever. You can't do all these things in eight games. There's too much left up to chance. If you get a zero from someone early, if one of those picks doesn't hit, I don't know how you make it. One of your late ones is going to have to be just brilliant. I don't know how many of those guys are going to be floating around because everybody knows what everybody's going to do. You're just figuring out how many games people are going to play. That's it. Little tidbits here and there, but... That's basically it. I'm not going to read through the first 50 picks. I'm not going to do that on today's show. So we're basically just going to pick up where we left off and go from there. I will tell you the last pick, though. Pick number 50 was Malcolm Brogdon. Pick 51 was me. I teased that on Friday, trying to decide if I wanted to let you guys in on who I picked at 51. And I went with it uh, in a direction that I I'm not generally accustomed to going, and that was De'Aaron Fox. And I know he's dealing with an ankle sprain, but I think he's back before the resumption season rolls. I think he plays in most of these games. The Kings are playing well, remember, prior to the shutdown. And he was a big reason why. He had finally started to hit some of that, that preseason hype from this year after a number of really rough months. He was number 92 on the season overall. Uh, last 10 games, he was inside the top 60. And if he keeps up that pace and you remove eight teams, that puts him inside the top 50. And if you think he's going to play in seven or eight games, which I'm hoping, that could even elevate him inside the top 40. So I went to Aaron Fox. I know it's unusual for me, but you know the other options there, I think DeJounte Murray was the other guy I was contemplating at that spot. And 
you know, looking back, if we had more information on Fox's ankle, if we knew for a fact he was going to be playing in the next seven days, I think I'd feel better about it. Maybe I should have gone Murray, just given the injury situation. But I don't know that the Spurs are going to push. I love DeJounte Murray. I think he's going to put up really nice numbers. I don't think they're going to push him that hard. And then anybody else to me was kind of one click down. And you'll hear these names as we go through them in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes or so. Steven Adams went at 52, which feels a bit early to me. Although maybe I'm forgetting. He was he was rolling in a top 50 clip for about the last three weeks. Uh, some of the stuff was a bit unsustainable, though. 2.7 combined steals and blocks. I don't know if that, that's something he can keep up. 12 and 10 with 64% shooting. That's doable. He was always someone that was trending up over the course of the year as he was getting healthy. But again, you know, the, the free throw thing is a mess. What if he gets to the line a bunch during this sprint? He got outperformed by his teammate, Nerlens Noel, in far fewer minutes. And so for Adams, we need health. We need him to be healthy. We need him to shoot over 60%, basically. I mean, can we count on these things happening? The one thing that's good on the Adams front is that, and, and I believe this for all of the Thunder, I think they're playing all eight games. Unless they get lodged, sort of lodged into a particular playoff spot before that final day, I think they're going into this with the intention, at least, of playing in all eight games. And I don't think you can say that about every team. So you do get the totals boost, most likely. But, listen, we're still talking about a guy that was hovering near the edge of the top 100 for most of the year. I thought he would be better than that. I admit it. I thought he would outperform this marker. But, you know, 11 points, 9.5 rebounds, 50-some-odd percent shooting, and about two combined steals and blocks. That was top 90. If that goes up to two and a half combined steals and blocks, if the points or rebounds come up a little bit or the field goal percent, yeah, you could see how he jumps forward a little bit. So it's not an insane pick, but he wouldn't have been my first choice of remaining centers. And neither would the next guy, Al Horford, who went at 53, and to me this is way early, because all of the reports out of Philadelphia are indicating that Ben Simmons is their starting four. We've heard Shake Milton has been running with the starting unit. By the way, I don't trust him enough to draft him with all of those guys healthy. But more than anything, this has given us an indicator that you've got a Milton Richardson, Tobias Harris, Simmons, Embiid starting five, and Al Horford is looking at 26, 27 minutes max off the bench, which doesn't work that great for him. Horford actually plays better around better people because he's a facilitator. He does all the little things. One thing working in his favor as the backup is that he's going to play backup five, and so that keeps him off of the power forward spot a little bit more, and that'll help his field goal percent. But this is a guy who was number 64, playing 31 minutes a game, with Joel Embiid missing a ton of time and logging most of his minutes at center or as the starting power forward. We saw when he got demoted for a couple of games, when that team was healthy for like three days in late February, Horford was bad. I don't want anything to do with him this early. Two rounds later, yeah, I would, but not here. Jalen Brown at 54, I'm fine with that. That's not too far off from where we had him on our... Actually, you know what? That's exactly where we had him. We have Jalen Brown at 54, right on the nose. I think there's still a couple of guys I would have taken before him here, but in terms of where should Jalen Brown go, this is probably about right. Yeah, I'm going to do about what he did during the regular season, probably play in seven games. Easy peasy. Could move along from that one. DeJounte Murray was the next one. Uh, our friend Josh Millman, friend of the show, Josh Millman, took a lot of the guys that I was eyeballing, and this was one of them. Murray was, I think, far better this year than most people realize. That's, that's one of those, like, this will catch you by surprise kind of things. He only averaged 25 minutes a game. He was dealing with that, with the recovery, and then he and Derek White were sharing the point guard job, which was a huge pain in the butt for the entire season. And then somehow, through all of that, Murray was number 71, on 11, 6, and 4 with 1.7 steals and good percentages. And that's in only 25 minutes a game. So, you know, you break this thing down. His minutes were trending up. DeJounte Murray was, he was averaging 27 and a half minutes a game in the last three weeks, and he was top 50 in that mix with 12 and a half, almost 6, 5, and over two steals a game. I don't need him to play 32 minutes during this resumption. I don't think they will play him that many minutes because, listen, they don't want him to get hurt in generally meaningless games for the Spurs at this point. 
Same token, he doesn't need that many minutes. He needs 25 to be useful, 27 to be great. Anything over, the, anything over that is gravy. And by the time DeMar DeRozan gets shut down, which won't be long in this thing, you're going to see a lot of DeJounte Murray. As I talk about him, I feel like maybe I should have taken him over De'Aaron Fox anyway. Just love that. Love that well-rounded stat set. In fact, I think if I had a do-over here, I'd probably switch those two. Anyway, I think this one's going to be... This one's almost a lock to beat his ADP. I thought Shabazz Napier might make it back to me. I really did. New hoop baller Adam King got him at... What the heck number are we at now? 56? Yeah. I mean, I risked it. As they say, you got to risk it to get the biscuit. I don't say that, but somebody does. I have Napier at 44 on our big board. So I could have taken him at my spot at 51 also, but I have Murray and Darren Fox slightly ahead or even dead heat with them, and I felt those guys were maybe a little bit more trustworthy. But I love Shabazz at this point. He's going to have a great resumption. There's no one in Washington. There's no one there. He can go nuts. Well, I mean, really, what's slowing him down? We saw those last few games he put together before the season shut down, and that was alongside Bradley Beal. That was top 50-level stuff with Beal healthy. So I, I don't see any reason why he won't just go buck wild right now. Th this is one of the things, by the way, and I want to uh, pause our discussion of, not the discussion, but pause the, the walking through the names here for just a moment. This is something that I think I struggle with maybe more than most or certainly as much as most. What I struggle with, because you guys know from listening to this podcast, or if you haven't listen to us during a draft season before you certainly will find out we are very cautious on draft day and my greatest target my greatest goal during draft season is not necessarily to get the highest ranked guy but to get the guy who's going to beat his draft position by the most while also getting as many highest ranked guys as possible mostly because you hit this, you hit this, and we've talked about this before also, but I'll, I'll go through it very quickly again. You're in this moment where you're trying to figure out which guy on your list is going to get snapped up before it pick gets back to you in a snake draft. Auction, obviously, is, is sort of a different beast. So would you rather take the guy that maybe, just to use an example here, say there's player A and player B. Player B is likely to finish slightly higher than player A. Maybe say player B is going to be number 35 and, and player A is going to be number 42 or something like that. But player A is getting drafted earlier than player B in almost every draft. That's just the way it's going. Because, you know, people get their projections wrong. But our projections say player B is going to be better than player A by about a half round. You have two choices there. If you take player B with your first pick of the two picks that we're talking about here, you get the guy that's going to be ranked 35, but you also know that there's a very low probability that player A makes it back to you. So you're going to get number 35, but instead of player A, who you also wanted, you might be stuck with player C, who's going to be number, I don't know, 49. Make it another seven, seven blop. The seven-slot uh, jump. Now, if you draft player A first, you get the number 42nd ranked guy, which is now the second best in the group. But there's a, call it 30 or 40% chance that player B makes it back to you, and you might end up with both the top 35 guy and the top 42 guy. Alternatively, you might take player A, and then player B doesn't make it back to you, and then you get stuck with number 42 and 49. This is this is the draft. This is your decision-making on draft day. Do you take the guy that you know to be the best of the three and, base, and virtually guarantee that you're not going to get the second best guy in the bunch? You're going to get the top guy and probably the third best guy. Or do you roll the dice a little bit Take the guy who's actually the second best but is generally getting drafted earlier and hope that the main target, who's getting drafted a little bit later, makes it back to you. You could end up with both 
number one and number two. That's the only way you could end up with the number one and number two guys, is to take the number two guy first. Does that make sense? It's hard to do on a podcast. This is something where you kind of need a visual diagram. But basically, there are two paths. Path one is if you take player B, you will not get player A, but you do get the guy ranked number one out of those three. If you take player A, you have a, we'll call it, 50-50 shot of still getting player B. Which of those two paths is more valuable. I tend to choose the second one to try to maximize the number of good players I can get, but at the same time, you roll the dice. You might not get your main target. Which loops us back around to this Shabazz Napier discussion. I really like Napier. I think he's generally going to be better during this resumption than some of these other guys on the board. I didn't think he was going to get picked this early. I mean... Odds are he probably wasn't going to make it all the way back to me at the end of round six. I had the third pick in the draft, so third from the end of the sixth round. Odds are he was going to get scooped up in there. But I took De'Aaron Fox thinking, look, here are two choices. And I was choosing between De'Aaron Fox and DeJounte Murray because in my mind, and this is a three-person hypo- or real situation as opposed to our two-player hypothetical with a random third person, I knew... That if I took Shabazz Napier, there was a 0% chance De'Aaron Fox and DeJounte Murray would make it back to me in the sixth round. Zero. Even if I think Shabazz might end up being the best of the bunch. I think they're actually going to be pretty well bunched up. Like, you might see Shabazz at, you know, 40 per game and Murray at like 46 and De'Aaron Fox at 49 or whatever it is. You mush them all together. It doesn't matter. Point is, they're all so close that, you know, trying to get one best one doesn't really fit in this particular scenario, but what does fit is that there are three paths to this. You could remove... Let's just take DeJounte Murray out of the mix for now. Let's make it a two-player situation again. Darren Fox is player A in our hypothetical. Shabazz Napier is player B. I think Napier finishes in front of Darren Fox by a tiny, tiny bit. I mean, they're almost neck and neck, but for this hypothetical, let's say it's more than that. Let's say it's by a couple spots. Let's say it's by like a round. I don't believe that, but we need it for this example. If I took him, I'm taking the guy I think finishes ahead, but I am eliminating any chance of getting the other guy that I wanted there. Whereas by taking player A, which in this case is De'Aaron Fox, because he is getting drafted earlier than Napier. uh, There's no, I don't have the data on that, but I'm sure of it. I'm certain of it without seeing any data. I think we can all agree that De'Aaron Fox is going to go before Shabazz in most of these drafts. By taking De'Aaron Fox, I leave myself some possibility, 10%, 20%, 30%, that the other guy I wanted there, in this case Napier, makes it back to me in the next round. He didn't, so I rolled the dice, and I didn't get both guys. And the simple fact that there was, there's like 20 picks between me and me, meant that it probably wasn't going to happen anyway, But that's how that scenario tied into the example we used without names, player A and player B. Do you think a certain guy gets back to you that you actually wanted more than the first guy? Because that's how you get both. We didn't. Big deal. Big whoop. It wasn't going to happen. But you get it. Aaron Gordon went at 57. I'm fine with that. You guys know I'm actually a little bit bullish on Aaron Gordon for this resumption. He and the Magic in particular were playing very fast prior to the shutdown. They had completely changed their offense, and I'm curious to see if that keeps going here. I'm hopeful that it will, and I ended up actually taking a Magic with my next selection. So I have no problem with that. I'm not going to go deep diving on Aaron Gordon because he's done that a few times on the podcast already. Mikhail Bridges went at 58. That is not that far off from where we've got him. We had him at 61 on our big board. He stands to benefit if Phoenix does start pulling the plug on people. We know that he's a guy that can post fantasy value without big usage, but, Evan, if he actually sees some usage, his value could skyrocket, and so I like this pick. I actually like a lot of these picks. Marcus Smart, when it's at uh, 59, which is, we had him at 52, 
I think he'll be fine. He'll be fairly reliable, kind of quiet productivity. Rashawn Holmes went at 60. Love that one. You guys know we love Rashawn Holmes around here. We've got him at 55 on our big board. I still think he plays plenty. And with no Harrison Barnes for the moment, the Nemanja Bialica voodoo doll situation rolls along. That clears out 30-some-odd minutes at power forward, mostly. I know, they were playing him at small forward. It's dumb. They'll... I, I honestly, I don't know. Maybe they'll play Bealitz at small forward. But Holmes is going to see his 20-some-odd minutes. He has to. He's played too well not to. This one surprised me. Norman Powell fell all the way to 61. Uh, I know that he's not in that lead dog spot when Freddie Van Vliet was out or when Kyle Lowry was out, but he played himself into a substantial bench roll coming in and just firing away at a good percentage. I have him at 49 on our big board. I think this is a really nice pick at 61. 62, Jakob Pertl. Um, Yeah, I've been slowly moving him up our board, but only as high as 84 right now. He has some pretty large deficiencies in his fantasy game. You know, we saw him in stretches where he was playing bigger minutes, and he still wasn't... He was good, sort of blocks, field goal percent kind of specialist guy, but he wasn't really in the mix on other stuff. Now, there's no one else to play center. Nobody, really. They have they, they could maybe go real small. Like, would they play Rudy Gay at center? Because Trey Lyles is out. LaMarcus Aldridge is out. Jakob Pertl's still not going to play, you know, 35 minutes. But you might see him in the high 20s, which, yeah, I, you know, I think this is still a little bit early for me on, on Jakob. I think there's uh, other more sure things floating around at this point. I get it. You sort of roll the dice on it, but there's there's plenty of centers still that you don't have to spend on at this point. Now, he's not getting back to them here, most likely, because, you know, we're talking about 22, I think, players in between picks, but I don't I don't think you needed to go him this early. Thomas Bryan at 63 in this draft is another one where you're rolling the dice a little bit. If he plays, he could be awesome. We don't know. We don't know if he's going to play. I've got Brian at 67, so it's not that far off. Basically, the fact that there's no one alive in Washington these days, uh, and I shouldn't use that nowadays with COVID and whatnot. So there's nobody nobody playing for this team at the moment. They are usageless. Everybody's going to have to just do a bunch of stuff. And so even 20 to 24 minutes a game, Brian's probably a you know top 90-ish type guy. So there's plenty of upside there. But... Is there any reason to run him? Is there any reason to run him ragged? This is a guy that missed most of the season with injury and then had COVID, and I just I don't trust him to play the number of minutes that you'd need for him to be fantasy uh, great. He'll be fantasy useful, but probably not great. And so to me, there's, there's too much of a risk there. Again, given some of the options still available, there are sure things still floating around at this point. You don't need to roll the dice yet. You don't need to. We're close. I'll tell you, we are probably like 10 picks away from when you just start getting silly. But we're not there yet. And you need sure things because, boy, the player pool dries up fast. What if Thomas Bryant plays like 18, 20 minutes a game and they just rein him in the entire eight-game stretch? That's a big, that's a big knock. Sixth round guys, these are still useful. TJ Warren was the next pick at 64. He's going to be great. Not as great as when we thought Brogdon and Oladipo might not be there, but dude was cruising with this exact lineup at the time of the shutdown. He was like a top 40 guy for the last month. He was awesome. He'll easily hit this mark. 64, no problem. Will Barton at 65, that's another easy one. I mean, this is the type of stuff I'm talking about. You know what you're getting out of T.J. Warren. He was 59 during the regular season. He was higher than this with all 30 teams in the mix. I mean, I see no reason why he's not going to be a top 50 guy. And Will Barton, almost the same idea. He was 67 during the regular season. You just pull out eight teams worth of players, and he moves into the 50s. Why would that change? He's had all this time to get healthy. Both of those guys will probably play seven of their team's eight games, if I had to guess. This is so easy. Why complicate it at this point? Brooke Lopez at 66. I think that's fine now. 
You know, we moved him way down our board, but we moved him only as far as 60, basically because, you know, I don't know how many games he's going to play. He was 61 during the regular season. Again, you take away eight teams, and that bumps him up into the, I think, high mid, mid to high 40s. Uh, and he was quite durable during the regular season. But the Bucks can wrap up first the number one seed in two games, and there's absolutely no reason to play Brook Lopez in all eight of these things. I think he probably plays in six, which really at this point, it's not that crazy. The thing that worries me even more than does he miss two games is how many minutes does he play in the games he's in? Because he wasn't racking up minutes. He's playing about 27 a game during the regular season. But that could easily come down to about 23, 24 if really the Bucks are just using these eight games to tune everybody up. So it does worry me a little bit. He's probably a guy I'm not drafting. Because there's just... If it hits, be swell. But there's just so much uncertainty. Here's one I like. Brandon Clark at 67. I think he's going to be great during this resumption. He was coming on prior to his injury, during the regular season. A lot to like about him. Uh, We have Clark at 57 on our big board, so someone's getting him about a round later, round's worth of value on the ADP, I believe. And Memphis has got to play all eight games, almost definitely. I see very few scenarios where all three teams chasing the Grizzlies lose enough to where Memphis doesn't have to put their whole butt into this eight-game thing. So give me eight games of Brandon Clark at, you know, top 75 per game value, and he's easily in the mid-50s, maybe higher by totals. Love it. Absolutely adore it. That was 67. All right, we'll do three more. Josh Richardson at 68. No thanks. I was actually, I was really hoping he was going to be a massive value coming into this resumption campaign because he was horrible during the regular season. Uh, where did Richardson finish? Like 130, something like that? He was horrible. Had an awful season. 156, yeesh. Injured, never really got his legs underneath him. Handful of games where he was 100% healthy. He was pretty good, but still the fourth option on that Philly team. This is too early. It's too early. If you're going to get Richardson, it's got to be at a value price, and this is not a value price. Not with still a handful of guys that are just easier to project I actually like Richardson you guys remember I talked about him I thought he might be a value during this resumption or even next year during the regular season after going for a top 160 in 48 games this year I thought he might fall I don't know even in this resumption campaign I thought he'd fall out towards the hell where the where do we have we have him at 88 this is 68 yeah I thought he'd fall farther. I really did. Too early um, for the for me on this one. Mike Conley at 69. Uh, we have Conley at 65. So I think that's about right. He was coming on. Utah's without Boyan Bogdanovich. He's going to play. He's going to get his usage. And he'll probably play seven games. So I'm fine with this one. Not a whole lot of analysis on this. I think he'll be fine. And the last one is my pick. We started with me. We'll end with me. 20 picks bookended by Dan the Bespris Bunch here is what I call this team, and that's Evan Fournier. At pick 70. I don't I don't truly know how he fell this far. I, it's like the most boring pick on earth, and it's simultaneously one of the best picks that I made so far. Evan Fournier was number 68 during the regular season, which, by the way, 68 is earlier than 70. Not by much, but he's been durable. He's been crazy consistent this year you're removing 27 percent of the players in front of him so if you just did that 27 percent of 68 is 18 picks that would move him to basically number 50 if nothing else changed on a per game basis on top of that Orlando really wants the seven seed to dodge the Bucks. He's going to play seven or maybe even all eight games, and that moves him earlier. I think you could see Evan Fournier in that 45, 40 to 45 range. And we got him at 70. I'll take it. I'll take it. And don't forget, everybody, while you're uh, lavishing praise upon me for getting super boring Evan Fournier at pick number 70. Check out manscaped.com. 
HoopBall20 is the promo code. 20% off and free shipping on your order. The Lawn Mower. Get it. Version 3.0. It's got a built-in LED light. Hell yeah. Check it. Pinch free shaving action. Manscaped.com. That's the spot. We need your help. We really do. Um, This thing is so darn close to turning into a super long-term partnership, but you guys are going to need to come along with us for the journey. So get a Manscaped item and use the promo code HoopBall20 and thank me for how cool it is, and then I'll thank you for helping us build a partnership. Once again, show's coming back for us here at HoopBall. DFS Today is back. If you're going to play DFS during this resumption campaign, start with that. Mike Apatria Santino, it is part of a great new team of guys. Can't wait to introduce you guys to uh, Brenton, Aaron, and Steven, part of our new DFS squad. Mike at the helm, keeping them all in line, all these rambunctious youngsters ready to go. That's DFS today. Today in sports betting, that's really going to be rolling come Thursday when actual major big league sports are back. Love it. They had a great show with my old buddy Dave Essler last week. Got to check that one out. Really, really excited about everything going on here at Hoop Ball. And then, of course, the big news of the day, new Hoop Baller, Adam King, in the mix. Go say hi to him on Twitter. Do it. Tell him Dan sent you. Have a great Monday, everybody. We'll keep breaking down the mock draft tomorrow. We're in countdown mode. Pretty soon, we're going to be breaking down real resumption drafts. And then at some point, we're actually just going to be talking about basketball. There was one tiny piece of NBA news here, so hopefully you guys didn't turn off the podcast yet. Uh, Demonis Sabonis, there's word that they're going to be somewhat light with him because of foot injuries. Nothing big. Sounds like he'll play through basically all of it. And we, you know, earlier this year, there were parts where, honestly, I got a little bit nervous because they were talking about knee stuff. And his, by the way, his per game production did come down after that. It wasn't noticeable. It wasn't like Malcolm Brogdon went from top 40 to top 140, but it was like, for Sabonis, it was top 35, and then it was like top 50 for a little bit. So there's just this little peel-off. Markel Fultz did not participate in 5-on-5 yet, but he'll probably be ready to go. And, and this is not fantasy-related, oh, by the way, Nerland's Noel tweaked his ankle. That's a little pisser. I'm not going to move him yet until we learn more on that front. Uh, The scrimmage games are going to have 10-minute quarters. So they're going uh, women's college basketball style, which, I mean, honestly, that's fine. It's, it's, it's actually kind of weird to me that they just lopped off two minutes of every quarter in these scrimmage games. Just make up whatever weird rules you want. It's such a small change to protect players while they're ramping up. Like, you, can't, you really can't trust the coaches to just dump a bunch of youngsters in in the fourth quarter. Whatever. I don't care. It's so it's, it's it matters so little that right, who cares? It is what it is. It is what it is, what it is, what it is. All right, that's your that's your Monday news. Uh back at you tomorrow, Tuesday. I'm sure we'll have more cool stuff to talk about. This is Fantasy NBA Today. I am Dan Bespris. We'll talk to you tomorrow. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.